McCafe ice drinks taste like summer feels, but what does summer feel like? At Dancing Piano Pixie says, summer feels like sitting in the sand with your toes in the water. At Triple J Downing says, summer is all party time and feeling hot. So there you have it. The tangy frozen strawberry lemonade with a deliciously sweet strawberry swirl tastes like party time and feeling hot. McCafe iced at McDonald's. Served until the 4th of September. Subject to availability, price and participation may vary. So, welcome to Frank Skinner in conversation with... Oh, I really want a sort of fanfare now, but Roger Daltrey is here in the studio. You don't need an introduction, but I, I do. I am tempted to say that you are one of the seminal voices of rock and roll music in the world. And that's not bad, is it? Well, if you think that, that's okay oh, by me. Come on, it's not just me. Yeah. This is, isn't yeah. an idea I've well, come up with on my Well, it's been a good own. career, yeah. Oh, getting, God. You know, Don't talk as if you're retired. <laughs> it's been a good career. <laughs> <laughs> well, you never know as being a singer. You know, voices tend to be the first thing to kind of start to give up. Yeah. Now as that, you get older, don't they? But that is true. I saw Charles Aznavour, the French singer, recently, and the first thing he said to the audience was, look, I'm going to be straight with you, my voice isn't what it was. And I thought, Wow. That's pretty upfront, but I've listened to your new album as long as I have you, and I'm, this I'm not giving you any ball now. Your voice just sounds as good as it did in 1968 or whatever. Thank you. What's the secret? I got lucky uh, in in two ways. One, one I was singing for a long time with a precancerous kind of condition. Oh, really? Which was, that's that's, which was that's one my... of your lucky things. <laughs> well, <laughs> lucky because it was pre-cancerous. Uh, okay. Um, but it made my voice very gravelly for a while, and singing was becoming hard work. And also, uh, the second thing was I, I got my hearing back by wearing hearing aids and could actually hear what I was singing. Okay. <laughs> well, what did you think? It's pretty good, isn't it? <laughs> really, seriously, for the first sort of... 30 years of the, the Who's career, it was very, very often, I couldn't ever hear myself on stage. It was the, the volume was so much. Yeah. So it was, I used to over sing and all those kind of things. Thanks to hearing myself. Yeah. <laughs> maybe for the first time, I could actually use my voice with all the things that it's got in it. And that's what I wanted to do on this record. Well, when you say that the pre cancerous thing, I don't understand why that was a plus. Well, it, 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 the vocal cords, are, it, 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 it's a tiny little piece of the body, but it's an incredibly complicated muscle. Okay. And if they don't collide perfectly together, the, yeah. the, two, the two sides of it, it allows air to escape. And that's when people have raspy voice, yeah. voices. So anyway, I, I, I managed to get to, to this fantastic throat doctor, the guy who did Adele and his, who, who hasn't he done, Sam Smith. He's okay. Everybody. But I was one of the first ones to go to him. And he lasered it off, this, this precancerous okay. thing. And all of a sudden, my vocal cords could meet. And I had the voice I had before I started over-singing yeah. in 1964 with well, the Who. But you really <laughs> have got that voice. I mean, the, the, the new single, which is How Far, that is, that is the Who voice, I would say. It's as high, as clear, as powerful. Well, yeah, I'm, I've got I a big pair of lungs, and uh, you have. And I, but the other secret is I work all the time. When the Who aren't touring, I've got my own little band. I've got two bands. I've got one I go out and earn a living with, and another little band I go out with that have got fiddles and you know accordions, all that kind okay. of stuff that I do charity gigs with. And okay, that, that's that's fun because that's a cheap show to put on. You know, yeah. doing Who songs is a very expensive. Yes. Show it to put on because you need lots of equipment and musicians <laughs> yeah. and all that stuff. So uh, I've, I've formed a cheap band for charities. I love that because <laughs> um, that new single it says I'm fed up of living out of a suitcase. I am getting sick of the of the travelling. Oh, really? That's, I love I love the singing and I love the, doing the shows, but the travelling dr drives you nuts, doesn't <laughs> it? <laughs> travelling is yeah, but Roger, it took you about fifty five years to get to this day. <laughs> Yeah, but it used to be fun. Yeah. I mean, do you remember when you could walk into airports in, in sort of half an hour? You'd be oh, through yeah. and on the plane. Now it's two and a half hours and there are queues everywhere. Everything is, you know, you almost have to strip naked before you get on the plane. Yes. It's all becoming a nightmare. You know? I hadn't thought of that, but yeah, it has changed a bit. In your days, you just... It was went, fun. Yeah, it's like getting I a can bus. I can remember travelling to, to, to America so many times and there was only the band on the plane. 
<laughs> yeah, but that's what happens when you get a private jet, no, Roger. No, 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 no. This was just ordinary really? BOAC in those days, wasn't okay. it? BOAC. And uh, quite often we'd have a plane to ourselves. Fabulous. Incredible. Will you tour this album? Is that is that a plan? I haven't got any plans to, because I'd have to... Again, I'd have to start another band. I'd have to use the musicians from the record, and I'd also have to find another 40 minutes worth of similar material because this wouldn't mix with who material no but this is your ninth solo album so you you are a genre in your own yeah but they're they're all very different albums aren't they i mean the the first album i did the daughtry album yeah that was all early leo sayer songs yeah uh with orchestra oh god giving it all away fantastic that's a great song fantastic i got lucky with that one so I tell you what, it's interesting to see you this close to a microphone without you, without you swinging it round and round your head. I'm glad you haven't done that because we, we we don't have that much equipment. Absolutely. <laughs> do you still do that? I do. With you know, very little of it now. Um, but uh, I I can do it if I have to. How did you? <laughs> it's a great form of protection. I bet it is. Yeah. Has it ever gone wrong? You must have slapped yourself it's around the head. It's only ever with gone. It. If it ever goes wrong, it's usually me that gets hurt. It okay. Wha- it it whacks into me. I've yeah. never hit any of the band ever with it. Uh, I thought that's why I Townsend remember, kept I, jump, I've only, jumping. I've only ever hit someone once deliberately with it. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good story. And Tell that, us that was a good story. That was a, that was a teddy boy. We were playing with Chuck Berry in in 1960. When the Stones were in the park, was it 69? Oh, yeah, yeah. The same day the Stones were in the park, we were in the Albert Hall. Okay. And we were on with Chuck Berry. We were supposed to be the headliner, and Chuck was supposed to be supporting us. But Chuck Berry, being Chuck Berry, threw a big wobbler, and, oh, he wants to be the headliner. Well, so we didn't care who goes on first. We didn't. We don't yeah. care about things like that. So anyway, we tossed a coin, and we were doing two shows that day. And... Uh, Chuck won the, 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 the toss and he chose to go on on the first show. So he, he was the headliner on that show. We supported him. Yeah. And on the second show, he had to support us, of course. Of course, Chuck Berry's audience was very different than the hippies that were supporting us at the time. Right. <laughs> they were all Ted, Ted's and rockers. Yeah. So anyway, Chuck did his show and left the stage and then we come on playing called Tommy and all that stuff that was the early days of Tommy and of course all these Ted's took umbrage to the lack of rock and roll music yeah. <laughs> and stormed the front of the stage and they were throwing they had those giant um, copper old old fashioned pennies yeah and they clipped the edges with oh so to make they them were sharp, sharp. Yeah. okay and they were and, and I saw and someone I saw this guy throw something and I didn't think anything of it, but the next thing I know, there's kind of got warm stuff coming down in, over my eye. Oh, and I put my hand up to my face, and it's it's just nicked my eyebrow. Yeah. <laughs> the blood is streaming down. And I, I happened to see him throw it. Yeah. And he was stuck in the middle of this crowd of Ted's, all shouting and screaming, you know, terrible language. Yeah. <laughs> I just pointed at him and started swinging the bike in an ever-arching, ever-arching loop. You know, it's yeah. got bigger and bigger and bigger, and I kept pointing <laughs> at him, and I just let it go, and, and it <laughs> happened to hit him sm- smack on his nose, and he deserved it. <laughs> Fantastic! That's brilliant. That's like um, the old slingshots of yesterday. It was. It was. I was a good shot with that thing. Yeah. I, I could take a cigarette out of someone, a roadie's mouth from about twenty yards. <laughs> well, it's, um, uh, it, for, for his health, it was a better thing in the long <laughs> it was. run. Yeah. I mean, I, I I wasn't going to go into this this early, but. Um, you didn't have a reputation in the early days that um, if you had a disagreement with somebody in the band, you'd um, you'd hit them. I was 18, 19, 20 years old. That's yeah. The, we're, it's kind of that period of your life, isn't it? And I used to, I used to love a ruck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't help it. I mean, I was brought up, in, you know, in Shepherd's Bush. It was a rough area. And, yeah. And uh, being a little guy, I used to get bullied quite a lot. So uh, that kind of... Uh, it sets off your f- fight or flight thing, and, yeah, and, and I you... always chose to fight. Yeah, exactly. Fight. So if I ever f- felt it was coming down on me, and you know, in a band, things can get quite heated at times. Yeah, I would always attack first because, as you know, surprises everything. Yeah, 
I don't do a lot of fighting <laughs> myself, and I'm going to take your word for well, it. Well, I found out fighting, you know, because I used to get bullied, that, that surprise was yeah. everything. But you knocked out Keith Moon, is the story. Huh? No, I didn't knock Keith out. You didn't knock him out, okay. No. Uh, and you just winged him. No, well, he, he did attack me with the, with the tambourine turned oh, sideways, wow. which would, had the bells kind of slashing at me. Yeah, and I had to do something about that because, uh, you know, he was he was in, in a raging temper. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I didn't knock him out, but I I did hit him. Yeah. I knocked Pete out once. Yeah. And that was again, he was drunk. Um, he 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 hit me with a guitar. <laughs> Holy! Do you and, ever just and sit a, around and have and Unfortunately for me, I was being held by the roadies because they knew what I was like. So they, instead of jumping on Pete, who was the drunk one, being aggressive, they jumped on me, thinking, "Oh God, look, something's going to happen here." And they're holding me, and uh, and he hits me. <laughs> but you never, you're never so a John says, well, Let him go. Down. I'll kill him. So so they let me go, and and, uh, and um. Unfortunately, Pete can't fight. He's, no. he's not a fighter, and, and he was drunk. And I just, I, I just hit him, with, and it was just the perfect timing punch. And he just went, his feet left the stage. <laughs> it's true. This, and the, the, the irony of this whole thing is that there was a film crew watching this, and they never shot one foot of it. Oh. The whole thing, and it's terrible. You could feel that on stage. There was a like a energy and a menace on stage just when you came on the stage it felt like you know when you're in a pub and the, the guys come in it felt like that the whole tone of the place changed it was really exhilarating just before you'd started playing even well i've never been in the audience no. when we're playing no, but, well take my word for it used to, pete did used to say you know being in the who was more like being being in a gang yeah than being in a band uh <laughs> But and, and and I suppose we were in some ways because he he was bullied at school, I was bullied at school. I don't think John was. I'm not. I, I, John was very quiet. You never really got much on it. But he was a big bloke anyway. So yeah. I don't think he was. Keith was completely crazy. <laughs> <laughs> he was a he was a great great bunch of people. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he was genius, but he was so out of control. Well, I remember him coming on stage that night and he, he came over the speakers. He like a big spider coming <laughs> over the speakers. He didn't walk onto the stage <laughs> normally. It looked very dangerous and probably was. But I always felt I didn't... And I had loads of albums and stuff, but I didn't really get The Who till the first time I saw him live. And when you see him live, you think, oh, man, this is... This is why they call themselves the greatest rock and roll band in the world. Cause it was it was just an experience. Yeah, I've always thought that, you know, um, we never quite ever got what we are on onto record. I think the closest we got was uh, Who's Next. Yeah. Um, but when you saw us live, there's no doubt that once people saw us, that's, I think that's the reason why we're still going today. And the audiences keep coming. Now it's another new young audience because they, you know, they young people see us now and they, they, they're kind of, they, they realise that this, is something different than what's out there. I'll tell you something. Um, I was saying on the new album, there are songs like 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 the single "How Far" when you sound like classic Who Roger Daltrey. But then there's other songs. There's there's a Nick Cave cover into my arms, and if someone had played it to me, honestly, I would not have known it was you. And I've heard you sing a lot. The whole album really is is it, it's it's a. Uh... It's about the voice and the, what the voice can do. And I wanted a, an album that touched people. So I found songs that touched me. And that Nick Cave song, Into My Arms, was, was uh, always one of my, one of my favourites. I've never thought that he sang it to the quality of the song. Nick has got this kind of dark quality yeah. to the song. I love it the way he does it, but I thought, I can do something more with this. My early days when I was a sheet metal worker in, in Acton in a factory, we used to sing a lot of Johnny Cash stuff. So that part of my voice has always been there. I've just never had a chance to use it. Yeah. And I thought, well, I'm going to do, I'm going to imagine myself, you know, how would, how would Johnny have sung this song? And um, so it is my low register, which you very rarely hear with The Who, because, you know, Pete writes the songs and he writes for his key. Yeah, uh, and I've always tried to sing in those keys. I don't quite so much anymore, <clears throat> but that's what I used to do. 
there's a great... I remember watching a documentary about Tommy, and I think originally the, the See Me, Feel Me song was Pete was going to sing it because they thought his voice was all sensitive and vulnerable and plaintive and yours was too much like a warrior. And then he said he was on his way to the, into the studio and he heard you singing it. And he thought, oh, my God, he's got it. He's absolutely got Tommy. That's the voice. He has to sing it. And it's a real... Even telling it now, I get a real yeah. tingle from it. Everybody gets the impression I'm hard now, and I'm not. I'm a really sensitive bloke. Yeah, well, you've established <laughs> you know, that so uh, far uh, in the uh, interview. Yeah, but... but I'm a bit upset with the way voices are going in, in music at the moment. The young voices, they're wasting their voices. And I think a lot of it's to do with the in-ear monitors they use. They're starting to sing in their heads. They're not use, They're not projecting. Oh, OK. I mean, when you hear, heard that gospel choir at the wedding, for instance, they were singing. Yes. You know, that just, woo, that's, that's a real voice. Something about having your voice in your head... And hearing it so loud, if you're not careful, it can stop you trying to project and the voices go up into the nose and everything comes a bit squeaky. That's interesting. Have, have you not heard it in yourself? Well, have never, you ever thought about it? I've never thought about Listen it. Listen to people's voices. But you are you are a student of the voice, <laughs> aren't you? You are, though. You well, obviously, suppose, because I've, obviously you've given it a lot of thought over the years. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I don't like the trained voice, for instance. I mean, it's great in theatre because it needs to be. You've got to do it eight times a week. Uh, night after night after night, you kind of have to sing that way. Yeah. But I, I, I think training voices sometimes knocks more out than it puts in to the voice. I was, I was reading an interview with, um, with Pete Townsend, and he said, um, well, first of all, he said, I've written six or seven new Who songs, and I played them to Roger, and he didn't like them. That must have been a bit awkward, was it? I can only be honest by what I heard. I, I'm trying to remember what songs they were because I haven't played. There was one that I thought had a lot of promise, lyrically. Okay. Um, but the other ones, they all sounded a bit Broadway to me. And I, I, can't, no. can't, I can't kind of put my head in that direction. You know? but, but you and him can have... I mean, Yeah, I'm always can... honest with him about... I mean, I have to tell him what I feel. Yeah. I'm, I've always told him what I feel. I'm one of the few people that haven't brown-nosed. Because writers like Pete, who, who, who's so prolific, I mean, he writes all the time. You know, it, it, they can suffer terrible from sycophantitis. I bet. Uh, yeah. And it, it destroys them in the end, because there's, no, there's nothing coming back. So everything is wonderful. And, of course, not everything we do ever is wonderful. No. A lot, a lot of it might be. We need pointers when it's going wrong. And you're his pointer. Well, I hope so. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, it, he can take it or leave it. I have to be honest yeah. about what I thought of them when I heard them. But what he went on to say in this interview, he said he found it frustrating that you didn't write more songs for The Who because he thought you were a much better songwriter than maybe you thought you were. I did a thing in, in New York a month ago with Niall Rogers um, for his foundation. I did some Who songs with Niall's band and they, and they played by music. So they had Who Are You and Barbara O'Reilly all written out, you know, okay. <laughs> in the dots. I love that. <laughs> and of course, music stands and <clears throat> things. And when they started to look at it, they, what they thought were easy, just three easy chords, and they saw the complexity of what goes on within a Who song. Yeah. They were astonished. But I've always known it's there. So, you know, I can write lyrics, but I'm, I'm not a great melody man. But you wrote Always Heading Home on the new album. I wrote the melody of that. I only wrote one line of the lyric. Oh, OK. <laughs> Come on, make your mind up, writer. <clears throat> well, I mean, that, that was a melody. That, that, that was something. That, I did that in, way back in 1992, I think. But that is a great song. Yeah, I, I, I love it. I, 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 I don't have a cigarette lighter anymore, but if I had them, I would have reached for it. It felt like one of those anthems you get at the end of a gig, you know. What, what, what I thought about that song is that it's a spiritual song. It's not a religious song, but it's very spirit, spiritual. And it travels. I think, you know, the, the, uh, what I like is as an end of an album, it's kind of the end of a journey and it's travelling. Yeah, but it feels like the end of a gig. That's why I'm asking yeah. if you're going to tour it. I could just see you I do that, that on stage now. I've done it. I did it at the Albert Hall in, uh, in, uh, in March for the Teenage Cancer Trust. It sounded great in the Albert yeah, Hall. I bet it did. I've, I've, I've often thought it would make a great, great song for for the Remembrance Day at, at the end of the First World War. 
Oh, other, yeah. other than a religious song. Yeah. You know, because I, I find this religious religion has suddenly become quite divisive, isn't it? Well, this you, you've got to try... I mean, that Nick Cave song, I think, begins, I don't believe in an interventionist God, which is one of the great <laughs> opening lines it of any great. song, I think. Well, wow. I, I am an atheist. You know, yeah. So, so, so I'm a Roman me. Catholic. <laughs> but, hey, we can still get on, right? Yeah, that's that's, a, I agree. That's, that's what counts. Are you going to tour Tommy with an orchestra, is that yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. It's the Who band without Zach Starkey. Okay. I can't afford him. <laughs> <laughs> this is Ringo's uh, yeah. son, we should yeah. say. Yes. He, he, yeah, he, he's a very expensive drummer, but he's a very good drummer. <laughs> uh, so I've got the cheap version, but he's very good. Do you think the Who will ever produce another rock opera, or is the rock opera genre just, has that gone now? Life's an opera, isn't it? Yeah, you, but... Uh, I don't, don't, don't you think it all adds up to be an opera? If you think about The Who, and I don't know if you've ever stood back, they were, like I say, quite a sort of tough guy, explosive band. And then suddenly they took a turn, and it probably began with Who's Next, where they became more experimental, more poetic, and then, you know, Tommy happened, Quadrophenia happened. I don't know if I can think of a modern band who well, could Tommy, who could to me, it. is the best opera ever written. I mean, I've I've been to quite a lot of operas recently, and uh, you know, there's not a lot of lyrics, is there? <laughs> <laughs> it's Italian. Lot, that's what it's, it is. It's a lot of repeated lines. And when I listen to Tommy, I think, well, you know, it's it's more of an opera than any of the others. I love you sitting there <laughs> thinking, well, it's not Tommy, is it? La Boheme. <laughs> yeah, I mean, mel- melodically, it's wonderful. Yeah. And, you know, and the melodies are wonderful, but. You know, I, I can only take one line repeated six times so much. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I can understand that. <laughs> you're, you're a tough audience. In the 70s, when I was uh, a young man, um, I, um, still at school, I always used to get NME every week and sounds every week and all those. I was obsessed and you were all over it. And in those days, you were often called Squire Daltrey. Oh. I remember. But that's uh, some journalist being smart. But there used to be pictures of you in tweeds, like, because you had a trout farm and stuff like that. I, I, yeah, I, I did, but I wasn't, that, I wasn't that person at all. No. I wore tweeds as a protest because everybody was starting to dress the same. And I thought, I, I'm wearing... If they're going to wear leather, I'm going to wear tweed. <laughs> but it, well, it looked great. I remember those pictures of the big cap sitting on the curly hair and you. Yeah, but... Um, trout glistening in the distance. Well, the, the, the trout was, was... That was all because I was interested in, in farming because I lived in the country. Yeah. I, I, we had to move out. It became very difficult to live in London and have any privacy at all. So we, we moved out of London. And, of course, if you live in the country, the best thing you can do if you live there is to give someone a job. So then I got into farming, started to employ people. Then and then I got bored. Me and a mate with with a bulldozer, <laughs> a oh, couple what? of bulldozers. We built <laughs> we built these enormous lakes. Yeah. And then st- decided we've got to put something in them. <laughs> yeah. And all my mates from Shepherd's Bush came down and they looked at all these lakes and and it's it, it, beautiful the fishery that I built. And they said, "You can't have all this to yourself. What about us in our council flats? You know." We won't, you know, we, we deserve places like this to come to and get wow. out of the house. This is socialism in <laughs> action. Yeah, so they, so, and they were right. So I opened it to the public to come fishing. And of course, once you, once I did that, all of a sudden I've got to have a supply of fish. Yeah. <laughs> so I bought a trout farm. I found one that was, was, was for sale. Didn't know anything about it. And I suddenly found an industry that was in its infancy. There's such bad practice going on, chemicals being used and stuff going on. It was terrible. And they were producing fish with no eyes, no tails. They didn't even barely look like a trout. <laughs> and, and I thought, I'm going to get, get involved in this and try and clean it up. And, and I did. I, you know, by the time I got out of it in 2000, I was producing perfect trout. And uh, we got salmon back in the Thames and all that kind of stuff. It's, I was really proud of that because it was that was that industry was could have gone really badly wrong for the rivers. It's brilliant because for me, you will always be synonymous with the trout industry. <laughs> well, not, because I have to put the other one in. That was, <laughs> <laughs> no, you always, I don't know. I went to. No, a everybody trout. thinks I'm a mad fisherman. I'm not at all. I'm not a mad fisherman. I was more interested in the science. 
I'm taking it that the Who don't smash up stuff anymore on stage. That that's no. kind of gone, hasn't it? The last one went. The last guitar got broken in oh, 2005 when mm. we went to Japan for the first time in our whole career. What really? <laughs> yeah, okay. and we played. We we were. We were way down on the bill because we'd never played there, and uh, Pete broke a guitar at the end. We were supporting Aerosmith. Okay, <laughs> so you did it, did it for old time's sake, kind of thing. Yeah, he kind of did it just for the Japanese, you know, the sacrificial, oh, the sacrificial guitar. <laughs> you know, there was, <laughs> and I've got that guitar actually. That's the one I he gave it to me at the end. Well, because it was broke. Because it was broke. Yeah, he wants to bring me to glue it back together, which I used to do in the old days. Did, I mean, the thing was that it was. Some people think that they kept like rubbishy guitars to smash up, but often you'd see him do a gig, and then the the guitar. Would they go. weren't rubbishy guitars. It was the real deal. I mean, hundreds of them. Did you have a meeting and to say, you know what? Maybe it's about time we stop wrecking the equipment. It became a it became a pain in the ass. Because you used to it smash really... speakers up as well, didn't no, you? No, no, I used to I used to no, I used to use the symbols on the microphone. Oh, okay. That was m my addition. Because what the, <clears throat> I don't think anyone really quite understood what we were doing. Um, the smashing thing was just the visual. Yeah. But the sound thing was what was to me more important. Because when that guitar was being broken, it, it used to scream. Yeah, it was the like feedback. sacrificial. Yeah, you know, it was really like a sacrifice, and it, and it could go on for five minutes. And, you know, so I, I used to just try things to do to add add to the noise and the whole cacophony of this, because it was kind of like like an abstract uh, soundscape of the Vietnam War at the time. That's what I was trying to create, you know. Wow, really? And I used to you kind of rub the mic up against key symbols and kind of do that with the symbol on the mic. So, <laughs> <laughs> it's great. It's quite. You can get that chopper sound, you know. Yeah, but as you say, it's art. That's what it but is. But no one ever wrote about the sound. They always wrote about the visual. And he smashed the guitar. Well, it was much more than that, I'm afraid. Yeah, but they wrote about it, right? <laughs> and that's what counts. But you, it's, as you say, it's not the sort of thing you can you could do forever. One of the great moments in rock and roll music. Can you? I bet you can guess what I'm going to say. It's the scream on "Won't Get Fooled Again." I don't know about that. Yeah, I just there's something every time I hear that, I goes that it goes down my spine. It's just a moment. It's like you say that thing about smashing stuff up. It's like the frustration and everything of the modern world comes out in one goes. I can't do it, and I'm not asking you to do it. No, I'm not no, going to do it. No, God <laughs> forbid. I wouldn't like. I wouldn't ask you that, Roger. But it's 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 it an iconic moment. It was supposed to be primal. It was supposed to be the. The primal scream. Was it scripted and planned? Or no, they were, Pete did a little yell. Kind of like, yeah! Yeah. And I thought, this yell could be better. <laughs> 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 uh, so, yes, it, it, it got it, better. It got a bit OTT, really, didn't it? <laughs> and what about the, the, the stammering on my generation? Was that... Whose idea was that? Is that something that uh, just happened? It's some, I, well, I used to have a stammer. I still do. And I kind of swallow it, but I still stammer. Okay. Um, and it was something that came out when we were trying to read the lyrics. I can't read lyrics and sing. I have to know the lyrics and sing from the head to the heart. Oh, so you have you to know, learn yeah, them by heart I, first. I, I, I just, it doesn't, I can't get them off the page and make them mean anything. Okay. Uh, and it was when I was first running it through that I started on the first line. Kit said immediately, Kit Lambert, our manager, who was our producer as well, oh, we've got to keep that in. The fade away was inferred on Pete's original demo. Yeah. The, yes. long, the long F. Yes. I, so I mean, it was kind of like a stammer, but then stammered the the, the beginning. And it works perfectly, because it's about a sort of a teenager and it's all perfect. that. It, yeah, insecurity yeah, and, yeah, insecurity. and all that. It's, a per it's, a perfect, it's the perfect opening line for that. That kind of arrogant song and it is wonderful. <laughs> I love the way you love the Who. I, I heard you talking about this album and you said to someone, uh, "Well, you know, it's a bit of a sideline when we made the solo stuff. The Who always comes first. And I thought he's such a team player, Roger. I love that. Well, I believe in the team. I'm I'm, I'm a great uh, believer that the team is always better than just the solo. The great bands. It's the chemistry between the the, the players that make them great. 
like Oasis, for instance. I mean, yeah. they're both good on their own. Liam's good on his own. Noel's good on his own. But together, they're much better. Yeah. And I wish they'd get back together, and I wish Liam was shut up on Twitter. <laughs> so, they, <laughs> so, so they give it a chance, Liam, because, you know, we all love you. and you, it, they, they, The chemistry of those two together is, is magical. I interviewed Ringo Starr once, and we got in the lift to go up to where I was interviewing him. And he said to me, uh, you're not going to talk about the Beatles, are you? <laughs> and I thought, this is going to be tricky. <laughs> <laughs> And some people are like that. They don't even, you know, they don't want to talk about stuff they did in the 60s or 70s. And I think probably it's because you've carried on that it's not a threat yeah, to you, if you know what I mean. It must be different for him. I, I don't know how they ever survived what they went through. I mean, that level of fame must have been extraordinary to live through. Can Rod, you imagine? Rod, Rod, are you They're in the, the home, mate? No, 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 no. Ours is... It, it, they were more... They were... You know, John Lennon was right. They were more famous than, than Jesus. You know, it was like worldwide hysteria. But you must have had a fair chunk of that stuff. Well, we had a bit of it, but, we, you know, we used to frighten people to death, so... It, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> No one's going to mob the who. They get their no. heads slapped up. <laughs> when I thought about you guys, I was watching the Eurovision Song Contest. I'm going to own up. And there was a stage invasion. And this bloke just come and took the microphone off this singer, the UK singer, and took it. And I thought this wouldn't have happened with the who. I remember well, it, at Woodstock. It, it, no, well, it, did, it did happen <clears throat> once. It happened on stage at the Fillmore East. Okay. Right back in, in 67. Uh, when someone ran up and I was singing Pinball Wizard and he snatched the microphone and he was just standing there in, in jeans and a, and a shirt and an old jacket and he snatched the microphone off me and went like, to do that to try and talk into it <laughs> I snatched it back and kept singing yeah. Keep, uh, Pete Chuck Berry duck walked across the stage with the guitar <laughs> and kicked promptly kicked him in the balls. <laughs> and it turned out that the guy was a plain coast cop. Oh, wow. And he was trying to make an announcement that the building next door was burning down. Could we please evacuate? <laughs> uh, so we were on the run all night, no, no doubt. Uh, exactly. Uh, yeah, exactly. We were, please tell me no one perished in the fight. No one door. perished. We got out. But, I mean, it was very serious. Wow. What about the acting? Because you are one of the few rock stars who really made the acting a, a legitimate career in its own right. Or did you see that as a sideline as well? It was a sideline. It was better than painting and decorating. Yeah. When the who weren't working. Um, <laughs> I don't think you needed to do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, uh, no, but the missus wanted the house painting. <laughs> okay. You know. Uh, no, but... Um, I, I can't. I'm in Listomania. No, I... I, I, I it, it was all happened because of Ken Russell. He got me into Tommy, and I fell in love with the whole process. And because <coughs> Tommy was easy for me, it was music, something I knew, and I invented his character. I didn't have to say anything; it was all singing, yeah, natural to me. Uh, but then I did, you know, when I did Listomania, I suddenly realised I didn't know how to how to deliver a line of dialogue. I had no idea, you know. I knew, I knew how to move around a film set and hit the spots and all that stuff. Yeah. So. um I thought, well, I'm going to just take every do job that comes through the uh, the letterbox and go out there and work. And that's what I did. I did all kinds of little stupid things, and I loved it. I remember I you loved it. when you played McVicker, you were great as, as John McVicker. I, I, yeah, that was something I wanted to do because it, it was a reflection of a lot of friends that I grew up with who did actually become bank robbers. And they, they all ended up with nothing. Uh, <clears throat> and John was... A, was very honest about his life that he, you know it's a mugs game. Yeah, it's a mugs game, and uh, he he turned out to be a good one because he came out from prison. He did a sociology degree. He did a sociology yeah. degree. Became a really good journalist, really good writer, and never been in trouble since. So but it's you great. did a, you did a great job on him in the film. You did Shakespeare. You, I mean. You know, that you, was fun, yeah. That was that was good fun. You've had an acting career that a lot of people would be happy with as actors. You know what I mean? Without, yeah, I, mean, I, I suppose. Yeah. Let me ask: Does it help? Because I have spoken to singers who say, you know, there are songs that you feel you have to do on stage, and I, there must be thirty that the Who feel maybe that they have to do, and they say, you know, you sing that you've sung a song a thousand times, it gets hard, and I wonder if 
with your acting experience, that helps you. You know what actors say you have to say every line like you've never said it before. I wonder if that helps you to keep those classic. If you have to do my generation, of well, Barbara that, O'Reilly. That, that is true because I, I always try and sing the song as though I'm singing it for the first time ever. Uh, the only there's only one song, and you'll be surprised what it is that I actually do start to get a little bit bored singing it, and I find it difficult, and I'm. I, might, I shouldn't really say what it is because <laughs> no, people will never hear it the same again, will they? Go on, tell us. You won't got... get fooled again. Oh, right. Yeah. Wow. I don't know why. I don't know why, but I'm just being really honest and saying that's the only song. All the others I can inhabit and... Isn't it uh, interesting? It's really strange. Have you ever wondered why, what it might yeah, be? Yeah, I'm wondering why now, but it is that <laughs> song. <laughs> That's not bad, though, just one. No, I know, and all the others, like, it's, you know, like Barbara O'Reilly and all that, it's, it's immediately back in the first moment of it. Yeah. And it's wonderful. That is an anthem worldwide. You can play that in any arena and everyone knows the worst. They, they all sing that chorus. No, it's, it's only a, bit a teenage like, wasteland. It's a bit like when Kennedy got shot. I remember the first time I heard that song. And and you, it's one of those rare ones. Often with a brilliant album, I think you don't really get it till four or five plays in. But that one was like an instant hit. You just knew there was something special about that. Well, it, I mean, the, just the quality of the Pete's, you know, the backing track that he put to it. It was all tape loops yeah, and, no, and working together. Which at the time I hadn't really heard anything like that. No, before. no one had. It didn't. I mean, at the time it came out, quite a, uh, sorry, who's next? Didn't get to number one in the charts. It, it didn't actually. It was really? Extraordinary people because it was so new at the time. People yeah. hadn't heard those sounds before. I know, this weird stuff that were doing. You know, but, but in in the fullness of time, it's been our most successful album. Uh, that and Quadrophenia. Am I right that Who's Next was a sort of a it's not what it was going to be. It was the remains of an album that never quite happened, or a live show, or a movie. It what? was the remains of what Pete envis- envisioned as a movie. Okay. And it was going to be called The Life House. It was Kit Lambert, because Kit Lambert was the ca- son of Constant Lambert, who was the founder of Sadler's Wells, the oh, composer okay. and, yeah. and conductor. And uh, so Kit was always saying, you know, rock, rock music can be much, much more than it is. It should be, we should be doing rock operas, you know. It can, the, there should be bigger pieces of music, not just the, the three-minute single is great, but together, you, you know, in a group of songs, it can add up to much more. And he was so right, of course. Uh, so Pete was always kind of looking for the next big story to tell. Yeah. Uh, and it was always about the human spirit, the human journey. It was that, that's what it was all. You know, very psychological stuff. I mean, look, listen to Quadrophenia, for instance. Go. Cool. I've got to end up with. Um, we have three things in common, Roger. People wouldn't think we have much in common, but we have. We were both expelled from school. You too. Yeah, oh, me I'm glad too. To hear that. Yeah. <laughs> what for? I was um, embezzling the school meal service. I re- uh, two dinners. I know I recycle. I found out where they threw the old dinner tickets, and I sold them to kids at half price. And uh, it threw the system completely, as you can imagine. You were for smoking, I think. Was that right? Well, I don't. I don't know. There was all sorts of things. Yes, Frank. I bet it was. It was. We're better not go into the it, details. Yeah, it, it, it was. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, we'll leave it there. But it's one of the best things, better things that happened to me in my life, to be honest. Being expelled. Yes. There you are, kids. Yes. Like a lesson to be learned from that. <laughs> no, well, I, you know, I, I kind of f- feel sorry for so many, probably, it's probably something like 60% of the youngsters out there today who would be driven to go to university and get some stupid degree that they're never going to be any good to them in, in their lives. And the ones that are being successful are the ones that leave school and go out and get a job and graft. Um, not everybody's good at being academic, are they? Um not that we should all be stupid, no. But I just think it's it's completely lost at the moment. I just want to tell you, I've got I've got two degrees. Have you? you? Yeah, sorry, mate. Have you really? <laughs> well, I'm an honorary doctor. <laughs> oh, well, there you go. I, I saw the bag you brought in. Also, the second thing we got in common, we've both played Alfred P. Doolittle on stage in My Fair Lady. Have you done that? Yeah. Oh, lovely. And thirdly, we've both done a football song. 
Oh, right. I don't know if you uh, knew I'd George, done one. No, what, what? I did one for England called Three Lions. Oh, right. Okay, I'm sorry that passed What's you by. What's your team, though? My team is West Brom. Oh, commiserate. <laughs> Thank you very much, yes. We do, uh, we do a funeral march for them yeah, but, at the moment. Yes, that is a bit sad. But you did Highbury Highs, yeah. which was a, a, a celebration of Arsenal leaving Highbury, which I didn't know about until recently. I watched footage of you singing it at the ground. Yeah, it was, it, I, I wanted to do a t- traditional... Do you remember the, the old cup finals? Oh, when, 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 the, when the, the, the Marine band used to come out with the white helmets. Ah, oh, brilliant. And they used to sing with, with a brass band. I thought, I want to do a song like that about Highbury because, you know, I've been going there for like 25 years and watched my son grow up there. And I just wanted something that, that kind of reflected on what Highbury as a ground And did you write it? to the club? I wrote that, yeah. yeah. Was it Highbury highs over North London skies? Oh. Oh, yes, Don't I will it remember. In. It's been great talking to you, Roger. I'm really glad you're still working. The album, as I say, is, is called As Long As I Have You. It's out now. I've listened to a lot of, you know, American music. I love Johnny Cash. I love all that, that stuff. And it's got all that. I was blown away by how good your voice is, and I'm not giving you any BS. And I'll tell you something else. I love the McCrary sisters who aren't do they backing great? vocals. Aren't they oh, great? Oh, they I make know. me tingle I wouldn't well. take anyone less... We tried putting session singers on over here, and I just I, I said, "This ain't the real deal." No, they. <laughs> so, so, so the producer Dave Erringer went over to Nashville and got the McCreary sisters out because uh, and and you know they're sibling voices. They do something, don't they? Well, as an atheist, that's the closest you'll ever hear to an heavenly choir. <laughs> <laughs> Look, it's been brilliant talking to you. Best of luck with the, the Who tour. Um, the album, I'm sure, will do brilliantly. Keep working, because it's, it's and you. great. And you. Cheers, mate.